Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. Hurricane Sally finally makes landfall in Alabama after gaining strength overnight. The Gulf Coast is being battered. Millions of people are facing another day of heavy rain and a potentially historic flooding threat. Brandon Rue is in. He's tracking the trajectory for us. But first, we want to get to some big breaking stories that we're following at this hour. A standoff with a gunman that started early Tuesday morning in northwest Detroit ends after more than 24 hours. Our Victor Williams will be joining us live with a closer look at how the standoff came to an end. But first, the Big Ten reverses course and announces a plan to play football beginning in October. The Big Ten tops our news here at noon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Evrod Kasimi. The football season will continue the weekend of October 24th. We do have team coverage for you of the big decision. Our Rob Maloney is live at the Big House Force out of Ann Arbor, but we do want to begin with Bernie Smilovitz. Bernie, walk us through what we know. The, the, that's a great question because facts are a little sketchy at this moment, but the Big Ten has called an audible. You remember August 11th, everything was moved to the spring. The conference announced today they're going to return to play. It'll begin the weekend of October 24th. We've heard conflicting. It's either October 23rd or 24th. Nothing definite on that. You could probably point to two reasons why this happened. First, rapid testing of COVID made everyone feel a lot better medically. But there's also pressure, which came from the players, coaches, parents, and even the White House. Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren says medically he's comfortable with playing football again. It's been an interesting year. But the good thing about where we are today, I always ask myself, are we better today than we were yesterday? And are we better today than we were 43 days ago? And the answer is unequivocally yes. We're better as a conference. We're better as a people. And that's why I'm comfortable to go forward and uh, return to competition. That is Kevin Warren, the commissioner. Now they're going to play an eight-game schedule. We know that. Six games from within your own division, then two other games from the other side. Then there's going to be a ninth game that will pair the second-place team in one division to the second-place team in the other division. Third place against third, fourth against fourth, right down the list. It's going to be a ninth game. They thought it would be kind of a nice little kick for the players to have that finish up that way. Well, standing by live at the Big House with more on today's redo is our own Rod Maloney. Hi, Rod. Hey, Bernie, good to see you. And, you know, it's a happy day out here at the University of Michigan. We're on the campus here. Uh, you can see the stadium, the big house behind me. Jim Harbaugh, who had been pushing for this for a, a long time, uh, came out with a statement today and basically said that he could see the pressure building and he's very happy to see football. In fact, he, he said, uh, stay positive, test negative, let's play some football. And that's exactly where we are right now. And so uh, a lot of the students were around today. And uh, to give you an idea of how happy they were, let's hear from them. Everyone wants it back, but understands why it was pushed off for a lot of time. Are you happy that they're going to play? Yeah, I'll be happy. Obviously, without fans, it'll be different, but at least it'll give us something to watch. <laughs> and to be part of. Yeah, be part of it on campus. And I know it'll be good for freshmen to like sort of have that back. I was able to go to all the games last year. And I know coming in, when I heard that the Big Ten and Pac-12 canceled the seasons, it was a real bummer. Um, I know the experience won't be the same going to games and tailgating the same. Um, but having the, the football atmosphere around is going to be huge because I know a lot of the other schools Everything has changed, but they still have football, whereas here we're sitting here not knowing what to do almost. And you get the impression by this uh, this decision that everybody in the Big Ten watching the down south teams playing football going, wait a minute, if they can, why can't we? And it was all about the testing and about the, the, the medical approach to this. Big Ten saying today that they figured that out. And uh, even U of M President uh, Schlissel said that he, he is very happy now uh, that they have figured out a way to do the automatic testing and to be able to make it so that uh, they can tamp down any problems if they crop up. So a lot more to talk about this. We'll have that more coming up on Local 4 News at 5 and 6. Reporting live from Ann Arbor, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right. A lot of people excited to see football back. Thank you very much, Rod. Right now, though, we want to get to some more breaking news at this hour. A former state senator charged for shooting up his ex-wife's car pleads guilty. Just moments ago at a pretrial conference, Virgil Smith 
pleaded guilty to malicious destruction of property and reckless discharge of a firearm. Felony assault and domestic violence charges were dropped as part of a deal. Smith admits to shooting at his ex-wife's car in 2015 after an argument. He'll be under probation until March. Until March. And even more breaking news at this hour. A standoff with a gunman that started early Tuesday in northwest Detroit ends after more than 24 hours. You're looking at video here from the scene. The home is in the 15,000 block of Iliad Street right near Fenkel and Telegraph. And that's where we find our Victor Williams. Let's get right out to him joining us live now with the breaking developments. And uh, Victor, how did this all come to an end and where is that final hostage? Well, Evrod, this all came to an end after the gunman decided to take his own life. As you can take a look right over here behind me, you might see some of the officers inside of the home. This is the closest that we've been able to get to the scene since all of this started. And the reason because of that is because there is no immediate threat anymore. Evrod, you asked about the other hostage. It turns out that man was able to escape a little after 430 this morning, right after the gunman fell asleep. So he is in no more immediate danger, but we did have the chance to speak to officers about what factors led to this being the end. He had made some threats to do that all throughout the last 30 hours uh, as we were talking to him. There was drug and alcohol use early on, uh, indicated he had run out of drugs, uh, so maybe he was agitated by uh, the fact that he was coming off of his high and had no more drugs to use. Uh, agitated by the fact that uh, he, he indicated to us that he knew he was going back to prison for the rest of his life. Um, so I guess he made a decision to not go that route. And we just saw the medical examiner coming here and actually taking the body of the gunman away, more than likely for an autopsy, even though we all know that the gunshot was self-inflicted, according to police. So we're just waiting to hear those reports, and we'll, of course, update the people when that happens. Reporting live, Victor Williams, Local 4. All righty, Victor, thank you for the update there. Hurricane Sally finally makes landfall after gaining strength overnight. The Gulf Coast being battered as we give you a live look from Destin, Florida. It is pretty wet out there right now. Hurricane Sally, however, brought 100 mile per hour winds and flooding after making landfall as a category two storm. Jay Gray takes us to Mobile, Alabama for a closer look at the impact there. Hey there, and thankfully right now a bit of a break from the rain. The wind's still gusting though, and you can see that behind me. Take a look. You can see it's still whipping the trees here and, and moving the lamp post back and forth a bit as you move down to Mobile Bay. What you'll notice is that the wind is still pushing the water here as well. White caps on the uh, bay here and, and you can see that mist uh, of the water that's still getting pushed around. And, and these are conditions that are going to continue for a while, not only here but across the region. Of course, this storm making landfall near Gulf Shores, Alabama, uh, just before sunrise and, and bringing with it violent winds, uh, a mounting surf that really pushed the storm surge inland uh, quite a bit there. And that storm surge added to the rain is going to cause, as the National Weather Service has alluded to, historic flooding in some of the low lying areas that this storm has affected right next door in Orange Beach. They saw more of the same with the driving rains there. We've got flooding in several areas and that water's not going to go anyway anytime soon. Uh, this storm has made landfall. It's just not real anxious to move away. That lingering slow progression is going to add to what are already difficult conditions here. Power lines down across the region. We know close to half a million without power. And again, this is something the area is going to have to deal with for the next several days. That's the latest right now here in Mobile. I'm Jay Gray. Back to you. All righty, Jay, stay safe out there. Right now, we do want to turn things over to meteorologist Brandon Rue, who has a look for us at Sally's trajectory, Brandon. Well, it will be on the move and move a lot quicker than it has. That's been the problem the last 24 hours. It was moving like three miles an hour, so just pounding the same areas with rain where we could see upwards of three feet when it's all said and done. Farther inland, they're still expecting what could be 10 to 12 inches of rain. As we have the radar loop going, and you can see the uh, landfall right there 
about uh, five o'clock this morning and it continues to pound the panhandle of Florida up into areas of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi still included category one storm and the trajectory is north and east. East and although there are 80 mile an hour winds and there has been at least one tornado report near Pensacola, again, it will start to lose a little steam here through the evening hours and it will pick up its speed and move very quickly through the day tomorrow and beyond. So still another 12 hours or so of flooding rains that the weather, uh, the National Hurricane Center calls catastrophic and life threatening, not good. Well, we still are dealing with some of that western wildfire smoke here back at home. We will start to see these clouds thin a little bit, but instead of middle 70s, we're only middle 60s right now. Still expecting to hit our mark of 80 degrees with dry weather here. A chance for some showers in the near future. A cold front coming in tonight, Evrod. I'll have more on that coming up. Brandon, Brandon will be checking in with him again shortly. Right now, though, we want to give you a look at some of your coronavirus headlines today. The Dearborn Schools Board of Education voted to extend online learning in the district until at least October 12th. In the meantime, the state is reporting 571 new coronavirus cases, and we lost 11 more people to the virus. On the national front now, the United States has officially surpassed 6,609,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases. More than 196,000 people have died from the virus. And these numbers coming from the Johns Hopkins University database. All right, so to come here on Local 4 News at Noon, very disturbing allegations about activities at an ICE facility down in Georgia. We'll tell you what a whistleblower is alleging and what some members of Congress want to be done about it.